welcome everybody. Thanks for coming out in this pre-Halloween, pre-election, pre-walkout um, blitz of information um, in the beautiful fog at the most intense and stressful period of the semester. So many reasons for you not to be here, but one important reason, which is that there's great poetry going to be heard tonight here. I'm Lynn Higinian from the English department, um, and I w want to tell you quickly what you will can expect this evening. Um, the grad student poet Serena Lay is going to introduce another grad student poet, Adrian Aku. He'll read, and then Bradford Taylor, also a grad student in the English department, is going to introduce our uh, esteemed guest, who is a, the Scottish poet W.N. Herbert, or Bill Herbert, um, and he's going to read. And uh, then afterwards, we can hang out for a little bit. It's h impossible for the Berkeley, the Cal Bookstore, to get copies of Bill Herbert's books because his publisher won't accept returns, or maybe not returns from the United States, which is actually fair enough. It's, it's complicated to deal with returns. But Bill very kindly brought some copies of his books here for you to look at. Uh, but they're also available for purchase. And after the reading, one of us can deal with the money issues and find out how much um, you should have to pay for them. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah, they get heavy. You probably pay you to take them back. He's been at Moe's. You would like to exchange the weight. Moe's uh, and Pegasus books um, can go back to the UK, and his books can stay here. Um, all right, Serena. When Adrian sent his poems to me last week, the first poems of his I had ever seen, he did so, as is his wont, on a platter of good-humored self-effacement. I've forgotten how difficult this is, he wrote, but more importantly, I fear I am only coming to terms with my poetics, too much Gnostic aphorism and headline fortune cookie acoustics. Having never been on the inside of a fortune cookie, I'm afraid I can't comment on the accuracy of that last remark, but I can imagine obliquely that the sonic life of a restaurant fortune is one of mute confinement, however dry, fragrant, rustling, broken suddenly into speech. And not just any speech, but the sort that freights each word, now anxiously, now mockingly, now full of smug bravado, with the hopes, fears, deepest longings, and greatest desires of its speaker. If these poems, with their certain brevity and bluntness of line, their certain affinity for and conservation of space on the page, bear resemblance to fortune or to headline, I'm inclined to believe it is an aural one. If they are now to be broken into speech, however, it is not to fill the cavity of their proclamations with new sentiment, but to expose an already extant mass, not dormant but painfully active, a labor of enclosure and presentation that frets and brandishes its force by turns. Burn, burden, same, shame, too, slow, or mediocrity is not the meagerness of capacity. Here is a poetry that thrusts, parries, and attends, taking up its guard between philosophy and practice, troubling the focus of desire, comfort or content, motion or completion. If resistance is delayed deracination, then the only movement forward is to rout or be routed. But the opposition, not always the enemy, ducks, weaves, and worst of all, asks questions. It is the speaker and a mirror of the speaker, a reflective surface hardened in the kiln of scholarship, athleticism, and a lifetime of observation. A cookie bearing these fortunes would be weighty indeed, but it is certainly our fortune to be guests of the encounter. Please join me now in welcoming to the podium the words and voice of my dear friend and cherished colleague, Adrian Aku. Uh, 
Um, thank you, Serena. That was really uh, generous and wonderful. And um, I'll try to keep the self-effacement down. Uh, my apologies, by the way, if my pronunciation is a little bit off tonight. I seem to have cut my tongue over the weekend at a bachelor party, which I guess really doesn't need a lot of explanation um, <laughs> at the moment. <laughs> so I'm just going to read a few. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to see a few dribs and drabs, and um, I've been doing these exercises uh, to kind of exercise out my obsession with Kipling's if, and that'll be pretty obvious when I get there. So, chairs. With the contamination of Bart's ecosystem by new chairs come a non-nativity, Waldo in the land of Waldos. They belong and are out of place. A plank on the ship of Theseus without the care for consideration, for you can never mistaken trans bay transit. No, they haunt by refusing to fit, wanted though they are. If the ship had first to sail to take its difference, a railed range of motion leaves a confluence of shoulds in one place that can only render strange such featureless space. Screens. Screens scry by way of the wire, by boxing time while you watch. Only loss is lossless. The archive artifacted the codec activity. Burden. Burn, burden, same, shame, too slow. Speed is, it seems, poetic difference. Content becomes desire, resistance, delayed deracination. About. If you can keep your head when all about you, Last delorecator, cedar of seeding, do you not, standing steady, run to glory? Notorious, intelligent only for numbness to the just world fallacy, move straight, then straight, flat fist of toffle. Ally bounded, concede to enemies owned, not chosen. Your unprincipled opposition are losing theirs and blaming it on you. Trust. If you can trust yourself when all men doubt you, then you must learn by waiting for foxholes and can only teach others to act taught, to know the pocket change counts, but not how. It is said that worries do no work, though they mark the landlord's game from monopoly, elide labor efficiently, Render integrity inert. Only processes void the voids fear finds in procedures, and only performance can project such revelations. There is no graver hero for the squad. So change the point of understanding. Surrender as the sight that moves the bowels, not the Socrates that asks but dies. Regulate with confidence but make allowance for their doubting, too. Heap. If you can make one heap all of your winnings, would you ever know? Code only stands one review. Hypnotism hedonistic and graft laughable. A gift grift cannot unravel. Like the best, like the best fencing point, a kiss, too taut a touch, can can't. Withdraw, and one will too. The carny carnal know-how. Fail to mention the crap shot and the wall, and risk on one turn of pitch and toss. And I'll just end here with everything. <laughs> Yours is the earth and everything that's in it. The discreteness of packets paint the torrent miraculous. Socrates, security question. Jesus, food pirate, marks the script kitty crashing kitten commodities. 
but also the prophet projected, Oreo suing me for my printed cookie. The genie's trick is how relation of replication is now relation of replication because proof is post difference. If now my inventory can be someone else's content, inheritance an occasion for dispossession, then no market remains. Just machismo as a race of reps. And which is more, you'll be a man, my son. Thank you. Thanks, Adrian. That was great. All right. I'm Bradford Taylor. Uh, and I happen to be teaching uh, to the Lighthouse in my reading and composition class at the moment. And it just so happens that according to the internet, uh, Bill Herbert lives in a lighthouse. Um, and uh, I'm not really sure what to make of this uh, coincidence. Um, I can't really get out of my head. Uh, Herbert's poetry bears little resemblance to Wolf's novel. Uh, her style tends to be vague and impressionistic. <coughs> Herbert's poetry tends to be concrete and active with people that have uh, arms and legs uh, that run, kick, and throw. Um, the words themselves uh, are almost visceral at times. Uh, he's also playful and really funny. Uh, Wolf's novel is, is not so much, as my students are finding out. Um, however, uh, reading Herbert's poetry and Wolf's novel together over these past two weeks has made it difficult for me not to think of Herbert as that unseen uh, Scottish lighthouse keeper, uh, toiling away in that displaced, overdetermined, but elusive space of fantasy and memories. From this vantage, uh, we can imagine him writing, standing above or standing upon the ferry, I watch it cross between the two shields of the Tyne, carrying the useful folk I cannot join, having no purpose to go south or north except the force of memory that at its most compressed becomes the memory of reading. Standing above the river in the study of my tower, my chalky highlight house, I watch the ferry slide, slide like a slowed down hockey puck across the ice of a demolished Dundee rink. Standing upon it, I remember through my feet the sway of discontinued fifies, the ferries across the Tay before I was five, before the road bridge was built in Dundee. In each case, I'm useless, displaced and thinking of the past and the poets who stood or thought of standing or remembered crossing on ferries between our clear diurnal moments, as though the transit was a jar of river water held up to check the progress of the sunlight through sediment. This moment, in many ways, this incredibly beautiful moment, uh, is exceptional in Herbert's poetry. Staying at home in that privileged symbolic artifice while the mind mnemonically wanders over the contours of the real world is only the precursor to a physical immersion in actual situations of displacement beyond the lighthouse. Uh, Bill Herbert, it seems to me, loves to travel to Moscow, Madrid, Crete, China, Siberia. And he loves to articulate a traveler's sense of alienation and wonder when confronted with foreign culture and language. But again, the alienation and wonder is yet a precursor to poetic adaptation and experimentation. Uh, I don't think Herbert could be said to have a style. Uh, his tone, his form, his subject matter, his language, which moves between English, Scots, uh, and tons of different translations. Uh, all of these are rigorously, but playfully, even irreverently, protean, uh, shifting always in order to better fit the particular object of experience, uh, or just for the hell of it. Uh, he introduces his volume, Bad Shaman Blues, with this epigraph from Anna Reed's The Shaman Coat, which I'll read because it seems to really get at what's peculiar about his poetry. The Kant saw the world in minutely observed physical detail, like a precise but perspectiveless scientific drawing. For example, they had no words that translated as bird or fish, only words for specific species. 80% of their vocabulary consisted of verbs. They were different ones for sitting on a log, sitting on a stump, sitting on the ground. And they possessed an extraordinary range of terms to do with sound. 
The noise a bear makes walking through cranberry bushes had its own word, as did the noise a duck makes landing quietly on water. Abstract nouns were few, the word for photograph literally translated as a pool of still water. Thinking of poetry this way, um, it's a little bit, it reminds me of what Deleuze might call a minor literature, one which functions lateral to established modes of discourse. For Herbert, it seems to me, uh, this discourse is poetry itself. Um, the force of these poems come from their refusal to force themselves on us in all those ways that poetry normally forces itself on us. It rejects poetry as that which we turn to only when we're traumatized or ecstatic, in favor of a poetry that can be everyday, but still weird and poignant. So for instance, the first poem in Bad Shaman Blues, uh, as a soccer player, one of my favorites, uh, is dedicated to aging football stars. Goodbye to all the players that their ratings decided we can't watch. The blate, the mediocre, the great but bloody luckless, and those who never gave a fuck. Goodbye to Batty Stuta and Gattuso, Maldini, Nedved, Hear My Blues, to Rui Costa, Canavara, Nesta, Morfeo, Buffin, and the best presenter, pun-drenched alter ego, boyish balding James Richardson, goodbye. Uh, this is an Easter 1916 for our day. Um, sit <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> uh, satirical, uh, but sensitive to loss, um, yet at the same time willing to make light of it. Uh, there's nothing triumphant or particularly tragic here. Uh, the world in which Herbert moves isn't conducive to those poetic transformations. Uh, but the way in which this world holds itself back can also be beautiful. The sea does not bring forth in autumn like an orchard. It draws back like a page that's pinched for turning. We read it in abeyance, not a swell. By way of biography, I'll once again rely on the internet. Uh, W.N. Herbert was born in Dundee, Scotland. He's published seven volumes of poetry and four pamphlets and is widely anthologized. His most recent Blood X collection, uh, that's his publisher, uh, Bad Shaman Blues, was shortlisted for the T.S. Eliot and Satire Prizes. Since 2001, he has been the lead poet for the award-winning West Park Development in Darlington, which is a text-led public art project. In recent years, he has focused on literary translation, editing an anthology of translations from contemporary Bulgarian poetry called A Balkan Exchange. Uh, he has also worked with Somali and Chinese poets. He lives in an old lighthouse in North Shields with the novelist Debbie Taylor, uh, which is also the name of my mother, uh, but I won't follow that coincidence out. Uh, <laughs> welcome, Bill Herbert. So it's always nice to discover your own long lost son. Um, uh, <laughs> I'd like to start by just thanking uh, Berkeley and, and, and Lynn Hegenian in particular for inviting me. I'm very honored to be here. I'm going to read 12 poems, um, a little less um, percussively than that. Um, and uh, the structure of these poems is, um, is uh, I thought, I might as well make a crab cannon out of them. Um, you know, I, I, I did the afternoon to myself, and I thought um, I'll just arrange these in a pretty pattern. So, uh, the, the 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 idea of the cannon is that there there are six themes which go in one order, and then they invert and they go in the other order. Uh, so, uh, the themes, as I understand them, are ghosts, the dead, rain, glacial food. <laughs> Losers, horse, another horse, some more losers, an actual glacier, a bat, the dead, and some more ghosts. Okay. Uh, thanks, but uh, I, I quite like this um, this this slight roughness. <coughs> Um, the reason for doing the canon is really because, as, uh, as uh, and your very kind and very perceptive introduction indicated, there isn't really a central style uh, to my work. Um, uh, most of its energies come from things colliding or merging or 
contrasting uh, with each other. So the, the space um, which uh, in a lot of writing happens within the poem, um, that, that tension for me generally happens between poems or, or between styles or between sections. So um, with that nice shape of the canon, everything else is up for grabs. The, the, there's, uh, there's poems in English, there's poems in Scots, there's more performative pieces, there's, there's less performative pieces, and it, it just falls as it will once we've, once we've put that, that stipulation on it. So I'll begin with a poem um, called um, Slow Animals Crossing. And uh, this is a, a poem set in Ireland um, where my parents lived for many years and where I would take my, uh, my daughter for the summer. And it's really a poem about signage um, and it's really a poem about the Irish um, uh, relaxed attitude to signage. Uh, when we when we were uh, driving through the, the, the little lanes of Donegal to, to go to my parents' house, uh, we always used to pass this sign uh, that said, um, slow animals crossing. And it didn't say, slow animals crossing. It was set out as this, slow animals crossing. So... <laughs> The poem became an occasion to tell a, a, a little ghost story. Um, slow animals crossing. Lemurs, somehow, at that lilt of the road, up and sideways at the trees, stooping through the farmyard on the way to Derry Bag. Surely, there are slower creatures who could cross. Turtles with their solemn wiping gait, or sloths who swim as though to sink is no disgrace. Such aqualungs of air would be trapped among their matted spider hair. I think of water since that night was full of it, and white frogs leapt into my lights like chewing gum attempting to free itself from tarmac. And I think of lemurs whenever I see that sign with its red letters because of the night, and the story of the three men walking home. And the man on the left said, good night to someone. And the man on the right, good night to someone else. And the man in the middle asked, who were they talking to? And one had seen a man, and one had seen a woman. And both described the third man's parents turning off at the road to the graveyard. And when I thought of lemurs, I'd forgotten they were named for the Latin word for spirits, and I only saw crawling slowly in my mind across the night road, back to my parents' house and my daughter, the bandit eyes and banded tails and soft grey backs and the white hands of lemurs delicately placed upon the twist and the shrug of the road. Now, um, I'm from Dundee, and we have a, a number of um, a very fine writers associated with that city, but we also have a number of uh, really wonderful musicians, and we, we, we've, um, we've suffered a series of, of quite tragic losses in, in this, uh, in this um, area over the last few years. So as I was um, getting ready to travel, I found out that a very... A uh, famous, important uh, Dundee singer called Michael Mara had just died, and, and Mike, Mike Mara was like a kind of um, Dundonian Tom Waits. He had this incredible, um, really gruff Dundee voice from uh, Lochy, and uh, he sang beautifully. So please look up, look him up on YouTube. Uh, there's a very uh, fine version of the Burns song "Green Grow the Rashes" that, that he, he uh, you'll, you'll find very easily on YouTube. Uh, so uh, I felt I should do something elegiac in, in his direction. And so I have a poem um, from a few years back about another 
Dundonian singer um, Billy Mackenzie, uh, and Billy was uh, was one of those extraordinary um, uh, octave stretching voices. He was a, a musician in, the, in the, a band called the Associates in the 1980s. Again, please seek him out. He's extraordinary, extraordinary voice. And I, I wrote an elegy for Billy, and this one is um, a kind of formal reappropriation. What Peter Mc my, my fellow informationist uh, Peter McCary calls rehab, where you where you go and you take some thing and you reuse it to your own end. Uh, so this elegy is in the, is in the stanza form of the scholar Gypsy, um, uh, which is appropriate as an elegiac stanza. It's also appropriate as Billy was an uh, was um, Irish traveller uh, of stock. He was, uh, he was uh, uh, what people still call erroneously uh, Gypsies. Uh, and, uh, and that's my background too. So uh, it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it seemed like an appropriate form to be appropriating. It's also a kind of collage poem in that it's absolutely stocked through with, with um, quotes from uh, his songs, um, but uh, you don't need that to get the poem, you know, it's, a, it's, just an, it's just an elegy for Billy, and I'm just dedicating it tonight to, to Mike Mara as well. A little epigraph from Nick Cave. Um, all in all, it would appear that the duende is too fragile to survive the compulsive modernity of the music industry. In the hysterical technocracy of modern music, sorrow is sent to the back of the class where it sits, pissing its pants in mortal terror. Duende needs space to breathe, melancholy hates haste and floats in silence. Um, uh, what happened to Billy uh, was uh, after spectacularly imploding his entire career and, and taking um, most of Warner Brothers with him, um, he he uh, he had a, a kind of period in the a period in the wilderness and uh, and then um, after a short depression uh, killed himself uh, um, after his mother's death. He's aged about 39, so kind of horrible, horrible silencing. The stranger in our city's voice is dead, so keep all Dundee silent for a day. Sheath all your spoons within their mourning cases. Fling all your florins in devalued tay. Let every mirror hold his fourteen faces. Our strangest voice is dead. Our angel of the rag cart and the river, the patron saint of Tinkies, whose gold lips could loose euphoric shrieks that split our hips. But now he's fallen out with song forever. Praise to that voice, which spans the octaves as the road bridge spans the river's range of tides and snell winds, bullies of Siberia. It holds the spheres together as they gride and squeal, that mile-wide voice. In theory, our town's diapes, ya bass. His gypsy holler was holy jabber code, our bowie of Baldoven Terrace. Hark to Billy, Bacharach of Baxter Park. He was the Shirley Bassey of Bonnie Bank Road. Lament now for the father who must touch a cheekbone in the barn at Ochter House, who knows it in the darkness and knows why it is so cold. Duveid in overdose, a photo album, dumbed at 39. Lament for that numb touch. Lament the kind of silence in that shed, the absence of all further variation on that one breathing theme thieved from creation. Lament Mackenzie's lovely son is dead. Lament and flood our gritty city, please. Let no more pearls form in its greedy bite to be flung in the Tay's unhearing glass. Dissolved, he rises like an opposite, the Catholic in all Calvinists, the lass within the laddie's ease. Lorca would know this spirit. His hair, planted now in Balgue, sends up Duende's shoots. His jawline was perfect. 
Let my tongue find its root in this town's most joyous voice, its most lamented. Now uh, I'll move sideways uh, into a kind of more informationist text. Uh, informationism being a kind of short-lived self-parodic, um, uh, unclear uh, attempt to engage with the information overload of the, of the technological era, which myself and a few other Scottish writers got up to in the, in the early 90s and then accused each other of being informationists and said, well, I'm not an information, you're, you're the real information, it's not me. I do, I, and, and so the emphasis was always on the ism, the ist part of it. But uh, it, was, uh, it was a kind of uh, a throwing down of the gauntlet to um, Scottish literature's uh, increasing fascination with scientism, with, with uh, McDermott's interest in the poetry of fact, um, uh, John Davidson's uh, kind of Nietzschean uh, 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 hubris. And, and uh, uh, it was a kind of um, a, a parody of our own uh, fascination, our own sense of our tradition. So uh, we, 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 we were trying uh, to, to take the idea of creating a tradition, but not take it entirely seriously, just, just take it on a few steps. So this one is called The Black Wet. It came about because I got a, a residency in, um, in Grasmere, in um, Wordsworth's uh, not quite in his cottage. I don't think they trusted anyone in there since De Quincey nearly burned the place down. Um, but uh, just up the road from it. And when I'd gone over there uh, for the interviews and so forth, it always been lovely sunny days. It'd been perfect weather. And then when I got the job and actually arrived to do the job, it started raining. And about three weeks later, I was sort of reflecting on, you know, is it going to stop raining or is it just going to be like this for the entire year? And uh, after about a month or so, I noticed that I was going out into the street and I'd only know it was raining because the tourists had umbrellas up. I'd, I'd, I'd become completely blind to the fact that the rain kept on going. And at that point, I realized that Wordsworth, although he mentions the rainbow, uh, doesn't ever seem to really make a lot of reference to the rain and is presumably on some kind of backhander from the tourist board, uh, never to mention the rain. And so I felt that the least I could do was a good old informationist list poem about the rain. So I went out and I interviewed lots of people and got their expressions for the rain. Uh, like a good informationist, and then like a bad informationist, I started slipping in my own expressions for the rain as well, so that there was a kind of a seamless um, uh, downpour of, of terms. Um, I should just explain one or two of those. Um, there's a reference to the various lakes, the, the Windermere and Thirlmere and so forth. Um, there's also a reference to uh, Sif, which is not a cleaning product in this instance. It is, it is the wife of the, the thunder god Thor, um, and her hair was met famously supposed to be made of gold. Um, there's also a reference to Huey, Dewey and Louie, which I presumably don't need to tell you are the, the nephews of, of Donald Duck. Okay, but, okay that, that, they're the nephews of Donald Duck. <laughs> it's called the black wet, which is a Scottish expression as opposed to, as opposed to snow, which is the, the white stuff. Um, it's raining stair rods and chair legs. It's raining candelabras and microwaves. It's raining eye sockets. When the sun shines through the shower, it's raining the hair of Sif, each strand of which is real gold. Carrot unknown. It's raining jellyfish, it's raining nuts, bolts, and pineal glands. It's raining a legion of fly noyads. It's raining marsupials and echidnae. It's raining anoraks in profusion. It's siling, it's spittering, it's stotting, it's teeming, it's pouring, it's snoring, it's planing, it's spaining. People look up, open their mouths momentarily, and drown. People look out of windows and say, send it down, David. Australians remark, Huey's missing the ball. Americans reply, 
Huey, Dewey and Louie are missing the ball. It is not merely raining, it's windering and thirling. It's buttering down. It's raining lakes. It's raining grass snakes. It's raining bala, baikal and balalaikas. It's raining soggy side winders and sadder adders. It's raining flu bugs, toby jugs and hearth rugs. It's raining vanity. The sky is one vast water clock and it's raining seconds, it's raining years. Already you have spent more of your life looking at the rain than you have sleeping, cooking, shopping and making love. It's raining Fuseli and Capaletti. It's raining mariners and albatrosses. It's raining iambic pentameters. Let's take a rain check. It's raining houndstooth and pinstripe. It's raining tweed. This is the tartan of muck rain. This is the best test of the wettest west. It is not raining locusts, just. Why rain pests when you can rain driving tests? It is raining through the holes in God's string vest. <clears throat> uh, now I need to make a slight sideways step again. This is the nice thing about having a, a principle for the reading. You just, you just have to hop channels to the next thing. And this one is uh, in Scots. Um, which is the, uh, the, the, the type of English spoken in the north of England, not just Scotland. So you, you'll find a lot of these language traits in, uh, in Newcastle, where I live now. Um, and it is a, a difference of uh, accent, it is a difference of grammar, and it is a difference of vocabulary. So there's a lot of tuning in, which I, I would ask if, if you would just uh, um, adjust your ears as we go. There's only uh, three, or, three or four pieces in Scots tonight, so I, I kept it down to about a third of the, the, the reading. But um, this uh, particular poem is again a kind of rehab. It's, uh, it's in the, the, the form that Burns wrote in a most uh, the standard Habby, which is a very short, percussive little stanza. So this is a kind of a modern tune played on a period instrument, if you like. Uh, it's called To a Moose. Um, and uh, um, the incident behind it was I was, I was being made a, a, a moose um, by um, some very um, devoted um, uh, 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 fans. Um, um, uh, uh, none, of this, none of this is true. I was just being made a moose by somebody, and the bloody thing wouldn't set. Uh, so they kept saying, oh, we'll, we'll just put it in the freezer for a bit. It will be great. And they would take it out half an hour later, and it'd still be sort of wobbling all over the place and kind of highly liquid uh, thing. And, and this went on for most of the evening. And at a certain point, because I'm very slow, it suddenly dawned on me that Burns had written a famous poem called To a Mouse. Um, uh, you know, we sleek at Tim Beastie, what's a, what a panic's in thy bristi. Um, and the, the Scots pronunciation, because we didn't have the, the vowel shift, which, which you're um, so um, uh, familiar uh, and generously endowed with, um, the Scottish pronunciation of mouse is still moose. So therefore I could write a poem called To a Moose, and it would be a completely different take on, on the, the form and the, yeah. yeah. So uh, here it is, um, To a Moose. O oh, Queen of Sludge, maist royal moose, your minions bear you bend the hoose. O oh, quaken shake ass, lavish, loose, desert o oh, fable, you pit the bumps back on my goose and shark my table. You lang cloacal loch o oh, chalk. Grecht flabby door at which I knock, and we my spoony seek a lock to mack ye gape. Ye flattened, talkless, cuckoo clock that drives me ape. Come, let me lift ye to my mouth, and pre your pertness we my tooth. You slake my hunger and my druth we one small bite. Come, pang my tombness to the ooth. Were brune delight. Let in and ah dig in their spades, and carvoot chocolate esplanades, and raise their umber serenades at Elka sip. Sweet Venus, Queen o' cocoa glades, and the muddied lip. 
I tried, of course, to introduce a, a chocolate mousse day to rival Burns Night with the haggis, uh, but it didn't go so well. Um, yeah. um, so now we'll do um, um, a, a, a slightly longer, more percussive Scots one, now that you've got your ear in. It obviously does satire quite well. Um, it also uh, is quite good at just sheer abuse. Um, and this uh, poem, uh, it, it, it reads now like it's a performance poem, but in fact when I wrote it, um, it was um, before slams and all that sort of stuff. And it was really modelled on William Dunbar, who is a medieval poet, uh, um, uh, a late medieval, early, early um, uh, uh, late 15th century, early 16th, early 16th century poet, um, who was an extraordinary craftsman, a very interesting writer, and who uh, wrote um, a famous uh, flighting, and this is a kind of done, uh, Scottish trait, that where two poets square off against each other and use very, very elaborate, very, very formalist um, uh, language to basically insult and abuse each other. And then this is done in the court before the king, and the king decides who, who wins. And, and this went on, uh, there's records of it for at least 150 years, uh, of flightings uh, um, basically being kind of institutionalized abuse. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a poem along the same veins. It's called Cabaret uh, McGonagall. And it's a poem about uh, losers of all sorts. William McGonagall was the poet um, from was the only poet from Dundee in the 19th century that anyone's ever heard of, and we've heard of him because he's the worst poet in the world. And, uh, and so uh, we, we were always given quite a low kind of starting point uh, as, as writers from Dundee. But he's also incredibly famous, and he's famous for a reason. Uh, he is uh, he is just so bad. He comes out the other end again. And so I was thinking about. I was thinking about the Cabaret Voltaire and the Dadaists, and I was thinking about, um, wouldn't it be nice if we had a Cabaret McGonagall, because uh, he was kind of like a Dadaist, he just didn't know it. And, um, and so I thought, who would, who would come to the Cabaret uh, McGonagall? And, and this is the... This is the list of those who would, who would come. Um, I won't bother going through uh, explaining all the references <clears throat> because there are quite a lot of them. Um, so this, you're being pelted with, with, um, with, with um, low culture in, in this piece, uh, I, I, I warn you. I will say um, there's a couple of phrases from Gaelic. Um, uh, uh, camera who means uh, how are you in, in my atrocious Gaelic. Um, the rest of it, there's a bit of French. Ah, you'll, be, you'll be fine. Cabaret McGonagall. Come, ah, ye dottled brain deed lunks, ye hibernating cyberpunks, gadget gadgies, comics geeks, guys we perfect rats physiques, folk with fuck all social skills, folk that when he tack their pills, can you can't even play football? Try the Cabaret McGonagall. The decor puts a cap on Uri, it's puke and flock a la tanduri. There's a sculpture made free canine stools. There's a robot armadillo drools when shown a footy of the Pope and a salad spinner cared for dope. Can you can't design a piss on the wall? Try the cabaret McGonagall. We got clangers, blimpers, gouks and mohair jumpers, bangers, whimpers, cats with stupid simpers. Camera who? Who are you and who's it going, pal? Welcome to the cabaret, Guillaume McGonagall. Gal. We got Dadaists, badass gits, shits with radar voices, futurists with suture dress and baguettes of James Joyce's. Bienvenue, why the fuck are you? Let's drink the nacht away. Come on your own or on the phone or to the cabaret. Come on ye birds that can scan, folk too scared to get a tan. Come on ye anxious chicken tykes, we stabilizers on your bikes. Folk was mothers wash their pants, folk was drink deodorants. Folk that think they caused the fall, like the cab McGonagall. For ah, that's cheesy, static, stale. This place goes so far off the scale. Oh, any wigwam bameter, mimesis would brack the pentameter. In order to improve the species' genes, you'll find self-operating guillotines. Bring your knitting, bring your shawl to the cabaret McGonagall. We got 
Berkhoffs, Jerkoffs, Noodles, Wiener, Neckers, Ubuis, Tubes, Wiesets, Poodles, Dresses, Vickers, Guten Abend, Aberdeen, Willkommen, Cumbernauld, the dregs of Scotland gather at Shays, McGonagall. We got mimes and tights, and McDermidite that his ain cell contradicts, Kelpies, Selkies, ground men that think they're picks, Buona Sera, Oban, and Ola to Astras Bay. Come in disguise, just to despise the hail damn cabaret. Panic attack, Mac is your DJ. The drugs he took were our class A. So he knew he can't leave the bog, though an ambient soons him laying a log. Feeling hungry, suka pluk. The son of Sonny Beans, your cook. Gin consuming humans does not appall. Try the bistro de McGonagall. Watch paranoia, peep pit speed until our flow bears parrots feed and knew it's squacking out and leads nobody kens till its beak bleeds. And when it fars wrecked off its perch, Pete gives himself the body search. The evidence is there for all at the cabaret McGonagall. We got weirdos, beardos, splutniks, fools, culdies, baldies, trekkies, ghouls, airheats for the west coast, steely knives and all. Welcome to the hotel, Guillaume McGonagall. We got imagists, bigamists, folk dug up with beakers, lit mag heads, shit their beds and fans of the new seekers, Doric loons with bothy tunes that plew your wits to clay. It's open mic for any shite doing at the cabaret. Alpha males are no allowed among this ootery footery crowd, though if they wear their alpha boots, as none of us can keep them out. And damn all women care to visit, and none of them ever seem to miss it. Can you suspect your dick's too small? Try the cabaret McGonagall. There's dumb dumb boys with wooden heeds, and Myrna Loy is snog and steed. There's one drunk wearing breeks he's peed. No, Don's the venerable bead. In fact, Don Ald scribe smells like tenuum. He's no change his habit of the last millennium. Can the wit she were born me his sturdy stall. Try the cabaret, McGonagall. We got lop lops and robocops and peri comatose, cyclops and zizi top and folk that pick their nose. Fair you wheel and cheery by and bon we to you all. The boonsers think we ought to leave the club, McGonagall. But we got mop tops and bebop bats and craps last tapeworm friends, swap shop vets and eurocrats. But damn all sapiens. Arriva derci rothsi at qui valley to the tea. I wish that I had ne'er set eye upon this cabaret. <laughs> now some horses. <laughs> a little existential horse first. Um, this is a, 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 a poem in English called A Difficult Horse. Uh, it's a true story. The horse is staring out to sea from a sloping field not far out of Aberdeen. I watch it from the train to Dundee. It is stationary, staring for the minute I have it in view. It is a small brown horse, possibly even a pony. The sea is calm. The horse looks like an old fisherman possibly even an old fish. It's difficult to imagine it ever moving. It's difficult to know what it is thinking. It is a difficult horse. Oh, right. Uh, um, this is a, a contrasting horse. This is a, a, this is a love horse. Um, <laughs> this is just to put another little um, note onto your understanding of Scots. The other thing that Scots does very well is, is tenderness, intimacy. It is, it's a, 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 a close language. Uh, I, I certainly I was talking about this um, uh, uh, with Lynn the other day. I, I, I speak Scots to my family. I speak Scots to my friends. Uh, I, don't, I don't generally speak Scots out of, out of Scotland. Uh, um, uh, uh, people tend to think, oh, where's your accent gone? And uh, it's, it's just that I'm not talking Scots to you. You know, that, that's, that's all. It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, not a, it's not a, an unfriendly thing, but it's, it's, it is a language of intimacy. And this is a little love poem. Uh, my wife was uh, doing a... a, a, a a, a kind of tour. She was going and writing about different places, and she, she was gone for about six months. And at this point, she was in China, and I wrote this little poem called The Horse of Blood. 
is one Gaelic expression in this one, Mochri. Uh, Mochri is just the, my heart, my darling. It's just, it's just an expression of intimacy. Can you no hear my hearts hooves clap on the cobbles out ben your far awa windy the nacht? Poo awa, my dear, they sheets that hap your sleeping ear. And then, qua to the glass we are licht. Do you no see the cuddy of blood that's champing of the street to blow your foreign bed the nacht? Come doon, mochri, he's slee but gid. He'll bear you safe and fleet as by your lover as thocht mecht. Now, the presence of two horse poems tell you that we flipped the cannon. We're now in the, in the, the, the other half of the, of the, the event. And uh, there's a, 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 another um, a poem in Scott's, the last one, um, that I'd like to read for you, uh, which is called Bad Shame and Blues. And um, there is, I think, um, uh, the, the business uh, of the, the small literatures. Um, the, the, there's a kind of a, a, an issue about your representativeness. The, uh, if you're a, a writer who uh, comes from a small country or who, who, who writes in a, in a, a, a relatively um, uh, restricted uh, language in terms of its audience group, the extent to which you regard it as being representative, or you, you stand for or you speak on behalf of. Um, and a lot of, a lot of Scottish writers um, have a, a very fraught relationship with this idea of, of the responsibility um, uh, uh, to represent. Um, because we do, I think, uh, have a much stronger and more intimate relation with our audiences than, than, than um, uh, our, our, certainly our English counterparts. Irish writers would probably uh, make the same uh, 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 statement. Uh, but that doesn't put us in the position of having to be their, their spokesman. Um, you know, the famous question Heaney was asked uh, by, a, by a Republican, um, uh, uh, when are you going to write for us? You know, when, when are you going to write for, for us? Uh, and, uh, um, of course, that's a kind of... Um, uh, an invidious position uh, to be to be put in. Uh, so I think the the bad shaman in this poem is is um, is someone who simply abnegated all of that responsibility and who in fact feels a distinct uh, resentment, if not dislike, of the, the the people that he's meant to be representing and, and healing. Um, and he is completely awful at it. He's clearly a, a loser of the of the the worst sort. Um, so it's a, it's a confessional poem. It's obviously in in, in Appropriate persona, and there is no division between me and, and the bad shaman that I can I can I can establish. Um, again, uh, this is one which uh, is, is full of of, of, of references um, to um, minor aspects of, of our our wonderful culture. Um, so I'll simply read it fast, uh, and that way that way we'll get through all those. <laughs> Uh, and it is a blues, so I'm afraid that I'm going to do what I think of as singing now. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, again, you please feel free to raise an eyebrow at this. Uh, um, but uh, it, you'll need to keep it raised for about three minutes. So you might want to, to choose your moment to raise the eyebrow. <laughs> Well, my ma bought me a bowring, but I can't keep the beating. When I see a sicky kiddy, I just start to greet. I've got the bad shaman blues. Bad shaman blues. Attack my magic mushrooms and begin to fly. But then I croodle in the corner while my harneys fry. I've got the bad shaman blues. Bad shaman blues. Oh, well, all good people with the porridge in your thighs. Get up and gang to work while I lie here and watch the crab sun rise. Cause I am just a jerk. And that's the muley droolin', puly foolin'. Bad shaman blues. Yeah, that's the grown man yelpin', poor Van Helsen. Bad shaman blues. Well, some people think I'm evil, but they haven't got a clue. Cause at the first apparition, I just Ouija to the loo. I've got the bad shaman poos. Bad shaman poos. I make it to the bathroom in my sleeping bags and the knot holes in the floorboards, they continue to nag. You've got the bad shaman blues. Bad shaman blues. All good people with the pies for eyes. It's time to stop for lunch. I'll tell you nay truths and I'll tell you nay lies. I'm what the monsters munch. 
because that's the pukey, rookey, plukey, stookey. Bad shaman blues. Yeah, that's the blacker massin, quater massin. Bad shaman blues. Well, I see the dots and spirals and I want to hide. I've got three white feathers that'll smother my pride because that's what bad shamans use. Bad shamans use. Doing below the river where the old queen sits, see me queuing for a stewing like a hopeless wee shit, because that's what bad shamans do. Bad shamans do. Oh well, they're all good people with sliders for spines. Drive off and pick up your kids, because the way I have to pay my library fines, my pants are full of skids. But that's a tottery, snottery, toss him out the cottery. Bad shaman blues. Yeah, that's a scoopy gang and hoovian. Act like you're Venusian. Bad shaman blues. Well, I meet a lot of people we sticks for heeds, and a lot of them are nutters and a few are deed. But that's the bad shaman blues. Bad shaman blues. And who the hell's a gimp like me? A goony help a man. My soul's an ella charcoal and it just fell in the sand. But that's what bad shamans do. Bad shamans do. Oh, good people with your heads are full of mince. Get out and buy some tat. Well, I think things that mark the spiders wince and act like I'm a bat. Cause that's the moaning, groaning, helpline phoning. Bad shaman blues. Yeah, that's the moulder and a scully, older than your woolly. Bad shaman blues. A lot of women blame me for behaviour by their exes. I'm otherwise an object of disdain for both the sexes. That's just bad shaman blues. Bad shaman blues. I like to think it helps to write your symptoms down, but I feel like I'm the public face of Eccles the goon. Bad shaman blues. Bad shaman blues. Oh, good people with hoch for hertz. Just get yourselves to sleep. I have a vigil set with Virgil where the devil farts that I'm too fair to keep. And that's the violet shrinking. Can he stop thinking? Bad shaman blues. It's just the buffy loving, tufty clubbing. Bad shaman blues, diminuendo section. It's the chittery, flittery, wittery, skittery, bad shaman blues. It's the shamble like a short stuck, randall and a hop kick. bad shaman blues. The hokum frickman, scrotum tichnin, bad shaman blues. The lab rat yellow, abbot and costello, bad shaman blues. Bad shaman blues. Bad shaman blues. Bad shaman blues. Who's bad? <laughs> <clears throat> Little uh, Jackson reference at the end there for the, the fans. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to skip a few now um, and destroy the, 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 the perfect nature of the canon because I, I feel that we're, we're moving towards the, the latter part. Um, so I'm going to read uh, a poem which is the, uh, the reply to the, in some respects, to the... Um, uh, the Black Wet. It's a poem um, just called The Bat, and it comes from the, the next collection, um, Omnesia. Um, Omnesia is a, is a nonce word. Uh, it's, uh, it, was, it was a great word until Obama came up with Romnesia, so I'm really grateful to him for that. Um, the idea uh, being that condition, um, which is really the opposite of the informationist premise that, that you, can, you can know everything. Uh, the, the, the omnesiac is someone who, who um, may well encounter everything, but remembers almost nothing. Um, uh, so it's a, it's a condition of modernity or of post-modernity, I can't remember which. And uh, the bat uh, in this poem is simply presented as, as a figure of that, um, that condition. Uh, and it's, it's, this is a, a Greek scene. The bat is being viewed at sunset uh, just after the, the, the sun has dropped in, in, a, in a fairly idyllic setting. And it's that point where you can still see the bat, um, because it's not quite dark enough, so it's actually physically, uh, it's visible in, in the air. In dusk, from in among the walnut tree, and it's bearing down upon the damaskina, although we never see the bat unwrap like a sticky sweet from the paper of suddenly frictionless, voiceless, wings 
It begins to bite, to try locate, to be anywhere at once in air's old film, wavering with half-seen insects. It's in the field, the garden, even underneath the canopy of vine leaves that by day shades the little patio. We watch the sky, a dropping sun's turned grey after an hour of lemon, mango, watermelon. Though this still lets some light be gleaned through a wing, like a sallow puffed out cheek, a torch shone through a bloodless hand. But gone in the second, you understand, as though showing how exactly we must leave each day and do a gathering of senses, sights too small or intricate to count as insight, too brief to form what we'd call belief. The bat, that master of departures, is lost tonight, forgetting as it misses each leaf and every branch, a figure of omnesia, the way the world desires to be the past. And, and then the last two. Um, this one is another elegy, so we're back with the dead. Um, uh, um, and I, I suppose I'm, I'm reading this one um, partly because I'm, I, I'm so struck by the spirits that should inhabit this building. Uh, the, the, I'm so struck by the, the, the very strong sense of, of, of a, a community uh, of writers. Um, uh, just in the few days I've been here, it seems to me to be the, one of the places where, where poets uh, talk, where dialogue exists, and where poetry therefore thrives. And so I, I wanted to read this one, which is about a poet, um, uh, Andrew. Um, Andrew Waterhouse, uh, who was uh, a dear friend of mine who um, uh, uh, had a terrible depressive outburst and killed himself um, and was um, uh, a keen musician, a very interesting, uh, fantastic writer with huge potential and uh, I, I wanted to write this elegy for him. The, the setup of the poem is, is the only thing I need to give you, which is that I was told about this. I was at a reading by Brandon Kennelly. And Brandon um, had just, um, someone had just played a, a little tune um, on the fiddle, the Sligo Maid. Um, and Brandon, apropos of that, had recited the Yeats poem, The Fiddler of Dooney. So it was one of those kind of Celtic moments where, where we all know what we're talking about in this, in this, in this, this tiny arena. Um, and The Fiddler of Dooney, uh, of course, is that marvellous thing, um, the idea that the fiddler will get into heaven first rather than his brother, the priest or whatever, because, because he brings joy. You know, he, 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 is the, he is the bringer of joy. And at that moment, someone came up and whispered in my ear that Andrew had killed himself, just at that exact uh, an exact moment. So the whole, with that kind of horrible, um, cruel um, uh, ruthlessness of, of, of the, 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 the poet, uh, the whole poem was sim simply right there at that point. I, 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 I left the room and wrote the poem straight away with absolutely no, no space to mourn um, and no space to consider it. It was just one of those kind of um, absolute um, arrivals. So it's called For Andrew Waterhouse, and it's about the community of the Northeast, the poets of, of my, of, of where I settled, and it's prefaced by this uh, little epigraph from Yeats. For the good are always the merry, save by an evil chance. Andrew was, of course, a fiddler. An Irish reel is in my ears, not one of yours. Northumberland has rival airs, but that was what they played the night I heard the Sligo maid. Strange, what endures. Displacement is our theme of themes. It's what remains. The way we can't remember dreams that still, like partial songs, affect the unmelodic intellect and tune our brains. So poets from the splintered north have made roots here. From south of Humber, past the forth, come settler saplings slow to bear, the fruit and leaves that feed the air, if granted years. And that was what you couldn't give your own song's book, 
the music's womb that wants to live, no matter what your mind may feel. We write laments for all the reels that your hand took. But what I mourn here more is the friend who died so friendless, for no one could prevent that end but you. Displaced completely from our love, your art, you needed numbness to be endless. The fiddler's first above, says Yeats. Let us abjure all music past those pearl-stuck gates. The breath inside a single air is worth all heaven's atmosphere. Yet it can't endure. And I'll finish as I started with a ghost and a ghost story. This is a poem called Shantiniketan. And Shantiniketan is the university, well, it's the town in which the university that Rabindranath Tagore uh, founded is located uh, north of Calcutta. And I went up there about 12 years ago um, uh, to talk to various people about um, uh, translation projects and the like. And um, while we were there, uh, we had one of those strange dreamlike uh, incidents um, that, that just again seemed to present itself as, a, as a, an eruption of something into the normal uh, pattern of things into into our, our um, uh, more or less authentic existence. Um, so I won't give the poem any more setup or explanation than that. Um, it's oh, I get it. Um, the, yeah, uh, my publisher um, has put the wrong. Uh, this is a typo. He's put the wrong uh, page reference in, so I'm looking, I'm looking carefully for the wrong page. Um, yeah, here we are. Shantanaketan. Dark on the concrete porch with Dabanjan's professor, in a deck chair chatting quietly beneath the increasing silence of the trees, but not so dark I couldn't see the high branches and the bats, darker blue blades against the welling blue milk of the silent starless sky, the space between each word and its neighbour growing longer, like a town becoming countryside, until we were walking home along the avenue of huge trees, and I saw someone smoking in the field, so dark now it was just the cold tip of their cigarette, just beyond where the tailor had stood with his table below the branches to repair the passerby's clothing. But there was another, dancing perhaps, or waving lazily, becoming my first fireflies. And then there were uncertain constellations of them, fireflies all the way back beside the broad canal until we came upon a crowd with ropes taught by the bend where the truck had slipped and fallen on one shoulder, spilling all its earthy rubble on the lawn, and it seemed as though we too should haul on the wrist-thick ropes in pitcher darkness now until we couldn't tell but felt the poise of the almost decided half-right truck, and then it thudded back with such determination that it threw us all back in our separate directions, and Debanjan and I went on to Prantic, never knowing that the broken-necked poor driver's ghost came blowing back with us, and drank molasses whiskey, and listened to us chat, and lay upon the spare bed in my room, and watched the ceiling fan's brown blade spin slowly to cessation. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Adrian. Um, hang out a bit. Talk to Bill. Talk to Adrian, Serena, Bradford.
um, take a look at the books. Um, how much are you charging for the books? I have no idea. I really haven't thought about it. Um, I don't know. Um, uh, maybe, uh, do you think $10? Yeah, t I, was, I was thinking, okay, $10 per maybe, volume. Maybe, maybe a bit more for the sick ones. Okay, 12 for the thick ones. <laughs> I don't take credit cards. <laughs> Thanks all.